Um, but yes, yeah, so we are looking at Mark chapter 10. Actually, after this week, we've got one more um, sermon in Mark's gospel. We're going to take a break from Mark. Um, as Anne said, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament book of Lamentation. So this is our penultimate time in Mark for a little while. But as Anne was reading out um, the end of our reading today, a um, bit of odd anticipation, maybe this is an easy question, but does, did, did Mark 10.45 sound familiar from any national event recently? Let me read Mark 10.45 again. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Has anyone heard that in a different context recently? You can tell me. Coronation, thank you, this is true. The coronation of King Charles III. And this was actually a real starring role this phrase had in the coronation service. There he is. Um, so right at the beginning of the service, if you, if you, I mean, maybe not everyone made it all the way through the service, maybe you might have got the very beginning, but a young boy comes up to the king and addresses him with these words, your majesty, as children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the king of kings. And King Charles replied, in his name, and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. So King Charles quoted directly from verse 45 of our reading during his coronation. This was apparently a very personal decision of his to emphasize he wants to be a monarch who, who works hard for his people. He wants to be someone who does serve in his rule. But of course, King Charles has to stop short of quoting the whole of that verse, as every human being and human ruler does, because this verse tells us unique things about who Jesus is. The full verse on the screen there, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. No human ruler can say exactly those words of themselves. Because, well, first of all, no human ruler can legitimately call themselves the Son of Man. As Anne said, the Son of Man's a title that means God's special king with all God's power and authority to put things right in God's world. It's, it's a unique title Jesus has, the Son of Man. But also no other human ruler can give their life with the purpose of giving it for as a ransom for many. Jesus is telling us something unique about himself here. In spite of being the Son of Man, God's special king, in spite of being worthy of all the service and honor we can ever give him, Jesus has come, he says, to die. Jesus has come to die, to give his life as a ransom for many, to pay the price for our sin. So Jesus, the Son of Man, gives his life for us so we can give our lives to him. He gives his life for us so we can now live for Jesus in this world as ransomed people, as prisoners who used to be captive to sin, but now we are set free to live for him and to follow him and to love him in this world. Again, if you're somebody who ever underlines your Bibles, Mark 10, 45 is a good one to underline. It captures so much about who Jesus is and why he has come. So that the heart of what Mark has been trying to say throughout this gospel. So let's look at this verse in its context together and see what it means for us. So looking at verse 32, as so often in the case in, in Mark's gospel, our passage begins with Jesus traveling on the road with his disciples. And again, we've seen that again and again in Mark. A disciple in Mark is someone who travels through life with Jesus, who spends time with Jesus, who watches Jesus, listens to Jesus, learns from Jesus, and is changed by Jesus. A disciple, very simply, is someone who is with Jesus in this world. And Mark tells us a bit about the geography of where they are. So verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem. So they're heading south to Jerusalem, the capital city of ancient Israel. And Jerusalem was built on a hill. So it's an uphill walk the closer you get to Jerusalem. But Mark also tells us what the atmosphere is like for his disciples as they travel. Again, verse 32 again, Jesus was leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. It always strikes me in Mark's gospel, whenever anyone meets Jesus, it always provokes strong emotions in them. Either they love him or they hate him. Either they're bothered by him or they're drawn to him. No one's ever kind of, yeah, Jesus, yeah. No, he always provokes strong emotions. But why are his disciples astonished and afraid 
here. Because for the third time in Mark's gospel, Jesus is telling them what is going to happen to him when they get to where they're going. Verse 32 again. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So Jesus doesn't leave his disciples in any doubt as to what he's come to do. Jesus has come to die. That's verses 32 to 35. Jesus, he's come to die. And it's the third time he's told his disciples he's going to do that. But this is the most detailed of all his predictions of his death. So for the first time, we're told where his death is going to happen in Jerusalem. We're told that both the Jews and the Gentiles will reject Jesus. They'll work together so that Jesus stands trial and is condemned to death. And the description of what will happen to Jesus when that happens is even more graphic than it has been before. The Gentiles he's handed over to, he says, will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. It is a grim picture of Jesus suffering in Jerusalem. No wonder the disciples are astonished and afraid by what Jesus is saying. He's their leader. He's the guy who looks after them. And he's saying, actually, when we go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. But he wants them to see that because Jesus' death is absolutely central to who he is and why he came in to the world. And again, as Christians, maybe we sing songs about the cross all the time. We are very used to it. But I wonder if verse 32 is a good guide for us as to how we should feel when we think about Jesus' death on the cross. Astonished and afraid. Astonished that the Son of Man, God's special King, would do this for us, would go to a cross. But also afraid because actually that's what it took to save us. That's how bad the situation is without Jesus. But let's let Jesus' words sink in. Here. He's leading the way to Jerusalem. One of the other gospel writers, Luke, says he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus absolutely determined to get to Jerusalem and face his death there. Why? Because he knows there's no other way to set us free from our sin and from death. So Jesus' death isn't the tragic end to a wonderful life or the victory of Jesus' enemies or something that took Jesus by surprise. No, Jesus knew what he was doing when he went to the cross. And he knew that was the only way to pay the ransom to set us free. So what did Jesus' words here tell us about humanity, about us? I think they show us just how ugly and serious our sin really is and how deep it goes in each one of us. And Jesus, he's describing how both Jewish and Gentile people are going to unite together against him and have him killed. And if you know anything about about those people from Mark's gospel so far, you'll know the Jewish people, the chief priests, teachers of the law, they hated the Gentiles. They hated the Romans who were ruling over them. And the Romans who were ruling over them, well, they hated the Jewish people as well. They were such a headache to them. And yet, according to Jesus, these people who hate each other are going to work together to unite to have Jesus killed. That's how much they hate Jesus. That's how much they reject Jesus. All of humanity, Jesus says, will be involved in rejecting him and having him put to death. Someone once put it like this. He said, the cross is what happens when humanity gets its hands on God. The cross is what happens when humanity gets its hands on God. And if we've been reading Mark up to chapter 10, we should realize it's even, it's even worse than we initially think. He's the son of man, but think of what sort of son of man he is, what sort of king he is. He's been cleansing those with leprosy. He's been healing the sick. He's been driving out demons. He raises a dead girl and gives her back to her parents. He feeds huge crowds of people, gives sight to the blind. And yet, after all that kindness and goodness, humanity still rejects Jesus. Can we... We often like to think of ourselves as open and sympathetic to Jesus and to spiritual things. We kind of read the gospel and say, I'm sure I would have been one of the ones cheering Jesus on. I'd have loved to see Jesus. But actually the cross shows us that ultimately we all reject God without God changing our hearts. We don't want Jesus to be Lord of our lives because we want to be Lord. 
and we don't want to worship him because we think we are the center of the universe. But the cross actually tells us some really ugly truths about ourselves. But of course, it tells us beautiful truths about Jesus. That against the dark background of human sin and rejection, Jesus is still determined to go to the cross. He still leads the way to Jerusalem, we're told. He's absolutely determined to do whatever it takes to save us, including giving his life for us. He's not dragging his feet. He's not reluctantly doing this. And this is why he's come. Verse 45, to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm mean, going to think a bit about what that, that verse 45 means. But before we get there, Mark kind of paints a picture of, again, just how, how lost the people are that Jesus is going to die to save. And the picture we get of that is through two of his disciples, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And what do we learn about James and John and what they say to Jesus in these verses? Well, very simply, Anne's already really spelt it out. James and John want to rule. They want to be in charge. They want to rule. Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, it's probably fairly straightforward, but, but in ancient Jewish tradition, the, the place of highest honor was at the center. So if you were in a meal, you'd be in the center of the table. And then the next most important person would be on your right, and the next most important person would be on your left. So basically what James and John are saying, we, we want to be right up there with you, Jesus. I want to say it's just a breathtaking move from James and John here. Again, look again at what, how they speak to Jesus. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You see, Jesus is like their butler at this point. Going, Jesus, come on, Jesus. And we, 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 we have you thinking, and we want you to sort this out for us. So enough of this depressing talk about suffering and dying. Back to the important stuff. We've got a plan for your coronation here. And we've got the seating plan here. And, and James, I think James is going to be here. I'm going to be here. Is that okay, Jesus? Right, make it happen. Thank you, Jesus. See, James and John want to rule with Jesus here. They're a powerful picture of human pride and self-centeredness. And it's really stark. They don't care about what Jesus has been saying about suffering and dying. They just care about what Jesus can do for them. And they don't care about the other disciples either. I mean, just think, um, we, most people think that Peter, the disciple, is the me and I witness for Mark. And often in, in Mark, actually, there's an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. But here James and John are deliberately excluding Peter from their plans. You sort of wonder, Peter, it's no wonder that Peter remembered this decades later and said to Mark, oh yeah, Mark, I remember that was the time, James and John, oh, I was so annoyed at him. They said, yeah, forget about Peter, just focus on us. This is a family thing, Jesus. We want to sit in that. I said, Peter, yeah, put him somewhere else, but we're, we know where we want to be. James and John, they don't really care about Jesus, and they don't really care about the other disciples. All they want is what Jesus can do for them. Teacher, do for us whatever we ask. I think we're meant to see an amazing contrast between Jesus and James and John. But actually, I think we're also meant to see ourselves in James and John. It can be easy to say, oh, James and John, they're terrible. But actually, left to our own devices, if we're honest, Every single one of us is just as proud and self-centered as James and John here. We're maybe just not brave enough to say it out loud. That's what they say. That's what they do. They say it out loud. I heard someone once describe what the Bible means by sin like this. Sin basically means we all have a God complex. We all want to be in charge of our lives and of how life affects us in this world. And because of this God complex, we don't love God. God's a threat to us. And we don't love other people because they're a threat to us. Because it goes like this. If I want to be in charge and you want to be in charge, well, we're not going to get on. We are going to clash, whether that's over the TV remote or whether that's over the money that we get, whether that's over just how people think of us. We are not going to get on. Because of our God complex, we each want to be God. We each hate the fact that we're not God. And so we see people not as people to love, but as a threat to us. That is what the Bible means when it talks about sin. We're a lot more like James and John here than we like to admit. And even when you step back and think about it, think about maybe 
the heart of some of your prayers. I've been struck by this this week. Verse 35, how many of your prayers could actually be summarized the way James and John speak to Jesus? God, Jesus, I want you to do for me whatever I ask. God, Jesus, I, I've been thinking and I know exactly what you need to do. So could you just do it, please? God, Jesus, I, if you love me, you should give me the life I want to live. Like James and John, we maybe hear all this stuff about the cross going, yeah, yeah, the cross. Yeah, but, but hang on, Jesus, get on to the important stuff. What about me? How do I get what I need? Or, or Jesus, I've, got, I've actually got a great plan for my own life. And if you could just make it happen, please. Thank you, Jesus. Actually, there's a sense where all of us are more like James and John than we like to think. We've all got this God complex. But there's good news for us when once we admit that we're more like James and John than we think. Because Jesus, he is here to show us a better way to live. Again, think back to what we looked at last week with the rich man with Mark, if you were here, that you can almost paraphrase that Jesus looked at James and John with all their foolishness and pride, and he loved them. He was patient with them. And he demonstrates his love for them and for all of us by showing us a better way to live, a way set free from our God complex. Because for Jesus, the path to true greatness, if you follow him, is the way of serving others the way he first served us. And why service is so important? Because basically service is like a concrete way of describing love. If we love other people, we serve them. If we serve other people, that's a sign of our love for them. Just as Jesus' service of us is the sign of his love for us. So again, you read the way Jesus and James and John speak, and Jesus is so patient with them. He doesn't say when they sort of address him like their butler, he doesn't say, how dare you speak to me like that? Or do you want to try again, James and John? Do you want to try again? No, he just says, what do you want me to do for you? And maybe he just puts it back on them. Go, well, okay, what do you want me to do for you? He is so patient with his foolish disciples. And that is good news for us, for we are foolish disciples too. And then Jesus speaks to them with gentleness and compassion. Verse 38, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Again, you see Jesus' kindness. and He's kind of giving them a way out. He's kind of going, okay, James, do you want to to roll back from this? But of course, James and John, being the sons of thunder, they sort of double down. Verse 39, we can, they said. I love that. Yeah, we can do that. That sounds fairly straightforward. We can drink the cup you drink. We can be baptized with the baptism you're baptized with. That's a difficult phrase to say. But what is all this talk about cups and baptisms? Well, I think for James and John, the cup was probably something they thought, oh, the cup, that probably means Jesus is going to have a toast at this big banquet when he becomes king. Uh, And he's going to drink it at the great banquet to establish his kingdom. So yeah, yeah, we can drink that cup. That sounds quite nice, actually. I'm quite thirsty. I've been walking quite a long time. And baptism, well, that maybe just means, yeah, but marks us out as belonging to Jesus, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah, we could be baptized with that. Jesus, that's great. Yeah, as long as we can, when we're dripping wet, we can sit on right and left. That, that's fine. That's fine, Jesus. But see, for Jesus, the cup and the baptism means some totally different things. The cup in the Old Testament is most often a reference to the cup of God's wrath, God's anger at human sin. It's a cup of suffering that sinners should drink because they have rejected God. But actually that amazingly Jesus says he's going to drink in our place. And baptism is literally, that that means to be be immersed, to be immersed in something. And the baptism Jesus is going to be immersed in is the punishment our sin deserves. He's going to go under, right into the heart of the wrath of his father and take that on himself so that we are spared it in the end. Is he saying to James and John, I'm going to drink the cup of God's wrath for you. I'm going to go under the waters of God's judgment for you. And you can't do that and live. That's why I'm going to do it for you. He says, my arrival in Jerusalem is not going to be marked by glory and victory. It's going to be marked by suffering and death in your place. You don't know what you're asking, James and John. And because I love you, I'm not going to give you what you're asking for. 
Okay, that's one of those strange ironies in the Gospels that James and John want to be at Jesus' right and left when he comes in his glory. And of course, a few chapters on, Mark 15, we learn there are people on Jesus' right and left, but they are crucified criminals being put there to punish them with Jesus at the center on a cross. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross so you don't have to, James and John. I'm going there so that you will be forgiven. You don't know what you're asking, James and John. How are we meant to respond to James and John here? It could be easy to be like the other disciples in verse 41. If you want to look down there, they just become indignant that James and John make such an arrogant and self-serving request of Jesus. But Jesus actually doesn't let the disciples get fueled by self-righteousness here. No, he summons all the disciples to him in verse 42 because he knows the same desires that have just been said out loud by James and John hide in every single one of our hearts. And so again, Jesus wants to show us a better way to live. Because actually sin, our God complex, it promises us so much. It, it literally promises you can be God. You can have everything your way. But the result is misery. The result is frustration because we're not God. Again, think back to Genesis 3 when, when Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Their eyes are opened and what do they see? That we're, we're gods. No, they see they're naked. Actually, if we try and live as if we are God, we're just going to get more and more frustrated and miserable. But we're not because we're not. That's, that's the big truth here. We're not God. That place is taken by God. And because we want to be God, we see other people as threats and we see God as a threat. And we see the misery of that all around us in conflict and racism and prejudice and sexism and relational breakdown. That is our God complex playing out because we're just battling each other. You see it in a school playground. You see that battle in a school playground and you see it on the streets of Ukraine. And you see it with a family squabbling over what to do for their holidays. And you see it in a boss lording it over her employees. Our God complexes just make us miserable. And Jesus wants to show us a better way to live. And more than that, verse 45, he wants to set us free so we can live that way. Again, I love that. That's why we thought about the picture of discipleship as learning Jesus together. It's the better way. It's like we, we just are so wired in to think it's all about me. And Jesus comes and he opens our eyes and he wants to show us actually it's about living for him, loving him and loving the people around us. Jesus wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He wants to restore the image of God in you. I love the idea of salvation. Actually, it's kind of, it's so many things, but it's about actually restoring your true humanity. The person you were meant to be. Someone who loves and serves other people, not tries to grasp things for themselves. That is the better way that Jesus shows his disciples here. Let me read from verse 42 again for us. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. See, for Jesus, true greatness is about how low you're willing to go to love other people in this world. Because again, that's what service is about at its heart. Service is about love. It's about loving your neighbor and loving God enough to serve them, to submit to them. He's calling the disciples to be distinctive here. He says, look at the Gentiles, the, you, you see the way they rule, you see the way the Romans rule, the way the chief priests rule. He says, don't learn from them, learn from me instead. Be salt and light in this world, he says, be different in this world. That's why we need to be a church that actually learns Jesus together, that, that listens to him more than all the other voices around us. Because if we're looking at the world around us, we're just going to see models that will lead us down that God complex road. We need to let Jesus define for us what true greatness is is as we listen to him in his word, as we worship him for his sacrifice for us. And as Christians, we need to listen to this because 
perhaps now more than ever in the generation we're living in, we're just seeing the, publicly the ways in which Christians have not always listened to Jesus. It's a terrible thing when Christians abuse power, when Christians lord it over other people. And we see that, leadership scandals, abusive Christian leaders, leaders who lord it over others. Jesus says, verse 43, you're going to see that all around you, but not so with you. Not so if you're following me. Again, I look at this, I just, I want to ask you to pray for anyone in leadership at Avenue. Please pray for me and Pete and Dan and Mike that we would learn from Jesus about how to lead. Pray for our staff team. Pray for our home group leaders. Pray for our youth and children's leaders. In fact, nearly every single person here is in some position of leadership. If you're a big brother or sister, you're kind of leading the little ones. But actually, it is so easy. The first whiff of power we get, we can abuse it. Jesus says, not so with you. Please pray that we would be different to the world. Pray that we would look to Jesus. And I want to, that's a simple solution. We kind of go, how can I avoid abuse of power? How can I do that? Just listen to Jesus in his word. Ask him to help you. This is at the heart of who Jesus is and why Jesus came into the world. He came to serve. He came to die. He came to give his life to set us free from sin. Verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Of course, the danger of all this talk of service is going, right, I've got to go after this and just work really hard at serving. I've got to just sort my life out. But actually, Jesus says at the end of verse 45, why the, any of this is possible. You can't do it on your own. But we can do it if we accept that ransom price that Jesus has paid for us. Again, I've said it's, it's a verse to underline. It's a verse to, to like camp out in. Mark 10, 45, like meditate on it, memorize it. There are coloring sheets at the back. If any left at the back, take them home and maybe color that in. Memorize this verse because it says so much about who Jesus is, but also who we're meant to be as people who follow him. Not to be served, but to serve. And to receive that ransom price that Jesus paid for us. Again, the language of ransom in the ancient world, it was money you would pay to buy the freedom of a slave or a prisoner of war. Again, we still have it sometimes in kidnapping instances. But by using this language, Jesus is saying something really important. He's saying, without him, we're all slaves to sin. We're all prisoners. He doesn't want us to go, right, I've just got to follow up to verse 44 and just work really hard. Verse 45 is the key. We need him to give his life as a ransom because we're not able to free ourselves from this life of selfishness. The only way we can be free of it is if Jesus pays the price for us. And the price is himself. Jesus isn't just like a millionaire going, I can cover this. He's the son of God. He says, I'm going to give my life to pay for these people to be free. To pay for these people to be in my family forever. Again, think again about that God complex. If the heart of sin is that we put ourselves where only God deserves to be, but the heart of the cross is that God puts himself where only we deserve to be. It's a straight swap. Jesus sees us, we're trying to be little gods. And he deserves to be punished for that because that's, that's ignoring the God who made us, rejecting him. Jesus, instead of you taking the punishment, I'm going to put myself where only you deserve to be so you can be part of my family, so you can be set free to live lives of love and service in this world. Pulling all this together, how will you respond to Jesus in the days ahead? I hope verse 32, there's a bit of astonishment at this, that it's not just, yeah, yeah. Actually, Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, came to suffer and die, to give his life as a ransom for many. And who are the sort of people he did that for? People like James and John. Foolish people like us. Selfish people like us. Loveless people like 
us. He gave his life for people like us, not because we deserve it, but because of his great love for us. I think our response to Jesus has to be one of worship and thanksgiving, doesn't it? And that might look different for different people here. And if you're somebody who's never put your trust in Jesus, worship and thanksgiving basically means for the first time saying, Jesus, I see who you really are. I'm sorry for trying to be God of my own life. Actually, you are God, and I want to trust you, and I want to thank you for giving your life for me. And you start following him. That is worship. And if you're someone who has already begun following Jesus, however long ago, worship is going, Jesus, I am sorry for the ways I still let the Gentiles, the world, model for me what true greatness is. I still want it for myself. Please forgive me and help me to live a life of service of you and love of you and others. And thank you for paying the price so that I could do that. We're not trapped, actually. We're no longer slaves to sin, the Bible tells us, because Jesus gave his life as our ransom. So actually the life he describes here, however idealistic it might seem, it is actually livable. It is livable as we come to Jesus and ask him to help us live it out. Again, think to yourself, in a a moment we're going to do this, who are the people Jesus might be calling you to love and serve? Where are the places he's calling you to follow him in this? What does it mean for you to be learning from Jesus in your life right now? A lot of people were commenting sort of how striking it was that King Charles used that phrase in his coronation, not to be served, but to serve. But how much more amazing is it when the Son of God says it? When Jesus says it and then spells out exactly what will be involved in him serving us and giving his life for us. It involves him dying and paying that price so that we can now live a new life, a life with Jesus, a life of love and service that points other people to him. Jesus came to die to set us free, to set us free to love him and love others. The question for us is, will we accept that ransom? Will we rejoice in it? And will we then live the lives he calls us to live? going to take a moment just on the screen. Um, We're going to turn to a time of of worship in a second, but just as we pray, let's just bring maybe what God is saying to us this morning to him. And I've already asked those questions, but who are the people Jesus might be calling you to love and serve in his name this week? It's good to put faces to that. Maybe the places in your life where Jesus wants to teach you what love and service in his name looks like in practice. Again, loving, like saying I love you is very easy. Serving people is harder. But serving is the tangible expression of love. And where do you need to learn Jesus in particular in your life at the moment? Let's just take a few minutes in the quiet just to think and to pray about that. And then Anne's going to lead us from that time.